So welcome uh, this afternoon to the Ecuador talk. Um, and since there are so many people here this afternoon, I thought I had in my mind I'd thought ten. <laughs> um, so the fact that there's many more than ten, uh, thank you very much, uh, and it gives me an opportunity just to, to say thanks for uh, for all the support you've given in the first seven or eight weeks or whatever it is that I'm here. Um, moving parish is always a, a, a challenging thing. I had forgotten about it because it's obviously 14 years since I did it. Um, um, but the fact that from the start you've been very welcoming and very supportive, so that's, so that's great. So thank you very much for that. Um, just to explain what I'm going to do this afternoon, as you see, there's a screen, so I'm going to give uh, a talk. Hopefully, you'll be able to see it and, um, you know, um, you know, understand uh, what the images are. Um, at the end of that, there'll be an opportunity for questions. So if anyone has a question they want to ask, or indeed at any time if you want to uh, jump up and say, hey, what about this, uh, then I'm happy to take that. Uh, at the end of... Once we've had some questions, um, we're going to have a little prayer, um, because apart from anything else, uh, today is election day in Ecuador, general election day, so, uh, so they do, in the midst of the violence and all that stuff, they do need our prayers. So I'm not sure if there's enough candles, but anyway, um, we have the image of Our Lady of Guayaquil, one of the images of Ecuador, Guayaquil, the city where I was. Uh, and I'll invite anyone that wants to, to come up and light a candle. We'll listen to the gospel story. We'll have a period of um, just quiet prayer for people to come up. And then uh, we'll finish with a hymn, which I will tell you what number it is. Um, but if it's all right, I'll just begin. So the, the purpose of today, several people had said, what about, what is the story of Ecuador? How did it come about? Um, so, um, sorry, and I shall, um, because various people have, you know, I was asked, will it be over in three hours? <laughs> um, so I shall, uh, the, whole, the whole experience, I would hope the whole experience will be over by within an hour, but anyway. Um, so in, um, when I was Pius Priest in Muirkirk, um, Bishop Taylor sent out an email or a, a text or whatever and, and asked, was anyone interested in going on the missions? And I made an initial kind of um, um, yes, that I thought that might be, I might do that. Um, and I thought about it on and off um, and basically discounted it. I was just turned 30 and discounted it because amongst other things, how could I possibly leave my disabled mother and all that kind of stuff? And you know, she needs all her help and all that kind of stuff. Bizarrely, 10 years later, she was 10 years older, uh, and I went away. But anyway, that's, that's, another, that's another story. So I found myself, uh, <coughs> when, <coughs> when I left Scotland, I thought I was going to Peru. And of course, in the way of these missionary societies, I landed in the, the central house, and I was told I was going to Ecuador. Um, and found myself in the city of Guayaquil, which is um, it's kind of like the way that Glasgow, oh, right, okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, the way that Glasgow is not the capital city, but it's the largest city. Guayaquil is the largest city in Ecuador. It's the port, um, which I'll come to in, uh, during the talk. It, it also produces some problems. Um, but you've probably, uh, if you've been watching the news um, recently, you'll have seen that um, there's been a lot of violence. As I say, it's the general election today, and in the run-up to the, the general election, one of the presidential candidates was uh, murdered last week, uh, Fernando Villavicencio, Villa, Villa um, and the, the picture on the right-hand side shows um, soldiers um, monitoring the streets, and that's, um, guns are a big thing. Um, uh, in Ecuador, people, it, it's not even like America where I think, as far as I understand, that you have to be licensed. Um, people can freely 
use arms and uh, have uh, have arms. Um, so, Ecuador is one of the smallest uh, countries in Central America. As you can see, it's minuscule compared with Brazil, but in fact, it is the same landmass as the United Kingdom. Okay, so I worked it out one one of the times I was born, um, and. You know, so it gives, a, it gives an, a, an idea of how big the other countries are. So Ecuador, um, the same, same land mass, sorry, Ecuador's here, in between Colombia, or bordered by Colombia and Peru. And um, it, it has one of the present things is that there's a big problem with drugs, that the drugs, Colombia and Peru were the big drug capitals of Central America, and in recent years, because particularly because Guayaquil is a major port, uh, a lot of the drug traffic uh, goes through Colombia and Peru to, to Europe, as far as I understand. And into that, um, I landed in a shantytown. This was an aerial photo that was taken just um, round about um, after, after my, maybe after three years. And in the midst of all of these uh, bamboo huts, uh, and makeshift huts, uh, we were able, Scotland was able to build um, this um, uh, church. So it's, it's a church that's probably, you know, a, a third bigger than this church. Um, it seats about 500 people. Um, and it's built on a hill like that. Um, well, if I show you, if I show you the next slide. So that's the kind of the waste ground that we were given, and it's in a, and it's a, it's in a slope like that, and from the top where I'm standing there, um, the church is built out, and underneath are, we were able to build some, um, maybe as many as 10 classroom, you know, kind of parish meeting rooms, uh, and a bigger hall that's maybe got seating for about um, 60 people. Um, and so, from that initial uh, picture when I arrived, whoops, sorry, from that initial picture when I arrived, um, that's what the church looks like. I was, last time I was there was last October, so that was, uh, that, uh, I took that in October. So you can see um, it's got lots of seating. Uh, as I say, probably there's a choir loft behind, um, and with the choir loft and the seats, there's probably uh, seating for about uh, 400, 500 people. Um, one of the great advantages, I was saying this to someone last night, one of the great advantages was that um, during almost the whole of my time, I was there for five years between 2004, 2009, um, the, the dollar, the exchange rate, the currency in Ecuador is the American dollar, and the exchange rate was one pound became two dollars. Sometimes it was two dollars, more than two dollars. So that someone, let's, Let's say someone had, you know, had donated a hundred pounds in Scotland, and someone had donated a hundred dollars in Boston. They were being as equally generous, but the Scottish money became double. You know, so we were. That, I mean, that's what. For instance, when we started building that church, I imagined that we would, you know, it was the end of my second or into my second year. Uh, of five, and I just presumed that we would all that we would be able to build was the ground floor, and the money just the people from Scotland were were generous, and uh, from back home were generous, and the money just kept coming, and said, let's let's build it. So we were very fortunate because if it had been if it had been now, you would only it, the exchange rate is more or less one dollar to a pound. So um, that's so. Those are some. Uh, general images that I took last October. Some of the houses, sorry, some of the bamboo huts have, have been brick built, but the way I, even with the brick built ones, that you would, you kind of look at them and you, from, I think from a Scottish point of view, I hope I'm not being uh, ungrateful, but from, from a Scottish point of view, uh, you would kind of look at it and say, it'll be nice when it's finished. Yeah. And then, then you find out that they've been living there for 20 years in that it'll be nice when it's finished house. Um, the other thing that's, um, yes, things have, have developed from, from
from the, from the very early days. But um, there is still no kind of what you would call infrastructure before any houses are built here. Um, all the piping, all the drainage, all the electricity is put in first before the houses are built. No, no, they do it the other way. They build the houses and then someday soon you'll get electricity. And one of the problems is that there is no drainage. Particularly on the right hand uh, picture, you see there's a gully there that's just been washed away by the rain. You know, so the heavy rains that, that it's not, it doesn't rain as much as it, or it doesn't rain as constantly as it does in Scotland, but when it does rain, it's torrential rain, you know, January, February, March into April, uh, and it's just torrential rain twice a day, and it just washes things away so that there's no, uh, so it's a, you know, you could fall down the gully or. Um, there'll be other, there's other pictures later on which, uh, which show um, some of the problems with drainage. One of the other problems, <laughs> it's a shanty town. So they don't have South Ayrshire Council coming round and picking up your rubbish, right? So your rubbish is just um, left at the street corners. Now the problem with that is that it's uh, 30 degrees. 35 degrees, 36 degrees, right? So if you're, if you're human waste, let's say, or if your food waste is uh, out in that, you know, that heat, then it just becomes, it becomes a disease, um, a, a disease problem. I, I did, so this is at the corner where the school is, and I, I, I did take a video last, last year, um, but I just deleted it because it was it was terrible when I thought about it. Um, there was there was a, a a man I would say probably about seventy uh, foraging through all of that to get food. You know, and you just kind of thought it, that's. But but on the other hand, he didn't have anything to eat. You know, so um, so he obviously needed something to eat. Now this is this is part of the problem. Um, they've got, they've got, uh, sorry, with drainage, they've got some running water from the city council, but it's not got proper drainage, it's not got uh, gutters or anything, and so the water just lies in big pools all around the sector, and equally with, with, the, with the heat of 36 degrees, generally, average of 36 degrees, you know, it becomes a, 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 the mosquitoes are attracted to it and all that stuff, and uh, various diseases, cholera and all that. So, in recent times, I used to give these talks um, and I, I realized this when I came back last year. The talks, I, I don't mean the talks I used to give weren't honest, but I used to give, oh, you know, food programs um, and education programs and health programs, and this is what we are doing, this is what the charity does, and all that kind of stuff. But I realized that one of the big problems in the country is the insecurity that's in the country just now, uh, caused, by the, caused by the gangland um, uh, infighting, or the gang infight. Um, about almost two years ago, uh, there was um, a spate of prison riots, um, and in one instance, 80 people were murdered overnight in the jails, um, and in another instance, 40. And when I when I was in the shanty town, it, it was it was almost like we lived in parallel universes. There was there was drug problems, there was crime problems, but it was parallel universes. I was getting on with the parish stuff and the catechesis and the schools and all that kind of stuff. And yes, our, our paths crossed in the sense when I had to, when I was asked to do funerals of, um, well, in one instance, the head teacher, the head teacher's aunt, uncle, and cousin were murdered in a triple murder about, about three blocks away from where I lived. Um, so I was sometimes asked to do funerals, but more or less our, our paths never crossed. Now, now the insecurity has come into the sector quite, quite a lot, and that, that's, that's the centre of um, the problem with the general election today. Who's going to provide the greatest uh, security? 
because, you know, it, like parallel universities, I mean, like the catechists and the school teachers aren't involved in drugs, aren't involved in you know, selling or buying drugs or whatever, you know. Um, but what, what is now happening is, you know, they'll go, and this happened while I was there, they'll go up to someone and say, terrible the insecurity here, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's terrible the insecurity. Do, do, you feel, do you feel secure? No, I feel insecure. Would you like to feel secure? Yes, I'd like to feel secure. I'm, you know, I, I, I run a security company. Oh, oh, that'd be great, you know. Would you like to be part of that security? Would you like me to provide your security? Yes, I would like to, you to provide your security. Well, it'll be $50 a month. Um, I don't have $50 a month. Boom. You know, you know they'll be slashed or whatever, or intimidated, and you know, so, so, I just felt, you know, if I don't tell, if I don't tell that story, then I'm not telling the truth. Um, so, um, through so these prison riots, um, the, the other thing, <laughs> I don't know if, if uh, uh, various times I've been um, uh, up at Bow House at Kilmarnock, you know, as, as a chaplain at the prison there, and you just know from, from TV and from your prison, you know, from what you understand, that People who commit crimes, go through a justice system, are eventually tried and sent to jail. And eventually, once the sentence is complete, you know, so the, and they live a, a, an austere life, you know, compared with, you know, normal house living. It's not like that. <laughs> the gang lords are in there, in the prisons, with their showers, with their shower units, their baths, their wives, um, etc. You know, and living in, you know, if they're a gang, uh, a leader of a gang, then, you know, they'll have a bit of luxury, which is, which is why they were able then to direct, you know, the fights and the riots and all that kind of stuff, you know, and how did the government, you know, if, if that happened here, it wouldn't happen here. But when it happened there, the government had to step in as a state of emergency. And, uh, you know, the soldiers went in to, to take control. And, of course, the problem is that it affects innocent, innocent well, untried people. There are lots of untried people. You know, if you're, in, if you're in jail here in Scotland, then you've been tried and, um, or you're awaiting trial, and there's a whole process. I mean, it, 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 the, there isn't a justice system. If I can give an example, uh, Edgar was one of our parish catechists, and by day he was a taxi driver working for a, a taxi company. He was maybe one of 20 taxi drivers. And uh, he, um, they just, they came one day and took him into jail. I said, what have I done? Well, you haven't done anything. It's the, it's the owner of the company that, that, that we're, uh, uh, you know, we're up against. Said, well, why, why haven't you taken him? No, no, we're taking uh, six of his workers. And so Edgar had to, uh, I don't mean work his way out of jail, but we had, you know, various people, and myself included, had to kind of go and see if we could negotiate to get him, get him out. You know, so there was a, in these prison riots, there was a lot of innocent people, people that were just in jail because of a corrupt system. Um, um, my own story. Um, so the reason I have put the picture of the Coca-Cola factory is that maybe at the end of my second year, um, it was still at the time where I didn't have access uh, to the bank account. Um, we didn't have access to a checkbook and all that kind of stuff. And we had to, uh, we had to deal in cash. So I was going to the bank and taking out five, ten, or more thousand dollars to pay the workers that were building the church or the school or whatever. Um, and this particular day, it certainly, I mean, as I say, I'd, at various times I had to take out something like ten thousand dollars, but this particular day I'd taken out three, um, and I'd put it in a folder and put it in the seat beside the car, gone to the bank, hadn't about, hadn't gone for a coffee in the shopping centre and just drove away 
and at the traffic light, um, I'd, I'd, you know, there was so much traffic at the traffic lights that, uh, that I, had to, I had to wait for two changes at the traffic lights. And when, uh, when I was at the second change, or before the second change of the traffic lights, I was at the front of the queue. And of course, you're looking ahead and you're, you know, you're concentrating on when the light's going to change. And I didn't even notice that my door had opened, gun against the head, keys to cash. And the, it was all over within about 10 seconds, I would say. The gun against the head, taking the cash. Um, and then I, I'm not sure if it was the same person or someone else reached in and took the car keys to disable me so I couldn't chase them, you know. So, um, so you know, it's the kind of, it's the kind of, I mean, I haven't, not told people that. Um, um, I had, I'm not saying I'd told it freely, but uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't kept it secret. But when I, when I came home, eventually came home in 2009, um, a couple of years later, I wrote, wrote an account of, of um, you know, my five years. And I had to sit my mum and dad down because I had told them everything. I'd, you know, when I was phoning home once a week, I would tell them about this story and that story and da da da. This actually happened because my fear was at that stage my mum, who was a great reader, had stopped reading shit. Her eyesight was bad. And I, I thought my, my fear was that my aunts were going to read the story and say, hey, you never told us that man had the gun against his head. But anyway, um, so, um, but obviously that was years later and they just had to say, all right, okay. <laughs> um, so I'll skip through some of these. As I say, the state of emergency uh, has produced uh, problems in the sector uh, where I lived. Um, the, the place where I lived is called uh, Nueva Prosperina, which, as you know, means new prosperous place. <laughs> so. Uh, it wasn't new or wasn't prosperous. Um, while I was here, the, the boy in the middle is called Justin, and that's his sister. Um, and um, he, he's a, he was, he's probably in sixth year now, but he was uh, in fifth year at the secondary school that we, that we set up. And uh, that's exactly what happened to him during the state of emergency, or during one of these uh, states of emergency. Sorry, while I was there. Um, he left the school, and they were told not to do this, but he left the school, he went to the corner shop, and started texting. He had a mobile phone, started texting, and someone came and, you know, slashed him, wanted his mobile phone. So just where he's, uh, sorry, where he's holding his leg there, um, that's where he was uh, uh, slashed. But they didn't, they didn't have any further attack, and the person ran away. But of course, there's no, no police were called, no, um, so. But the Sacred Family School, um, it was actually set up in 2003, a year before I arrived, but with, um, when I arrived, there was <coughs> nine bamboo huts. Um, probably a bamboo hut would be the size of maybe five of the benches. You know, and into that space was um, 30 pupils, you know, um, uh, squashed in. So we, over, the, over the piece, we were able to negotiate an extension of the, the land, and, you know, um, with Scottish money, we were able to uh, build. At the end, it was 29 classrooms, uh, brick-built classrooms, which have withstood earthquakes and all that kind of stuff, so they're very sturdy. And the reason, the reason that that's important is in the midst of the poverty, the school becomes a real vehicle for dignity. It becomes a real vehicle for, for hope for the children, um, for progressing uh, and coming on. Uh, I'm going to show you a wee short video. Um, it, there's a lot of noise in the background because there's 400 people, so they're, you know. But anyway, the, um, they're just saying they're going to say thank you to Scotland.
So basically, hello and thank you, Scotland. So, um, so the secondary, sorry, the, the school is a primary and secondary school. It used to have 500 pupils during COVID. Actually, during COVID, schools were shut down for two years. So, and when they went back, they only had 300 pupils, but it seems now with the change of head teacher last year, uh, she's been able to, Gisela, the head teacher, has been able to uh, up the role to round about 400. So getting, getting back to where it was almost pre-pandemic. -pan, pre also, um, it, there's actually more um, secondary school pupils than there are primary school pupils because there are other primary school uh, primary schools in the shanty towns, but there's no other secondary schools. So, um, having said that, even when you think about that, you know that's a big school, you know. But there's lots and lots of people um, don't go to don't go to school. They can't afford the the whatever twenty twenty dollars a month uh, school fees. Um, but um, it's always a very happy. I mean, like like the welcome I received, I have received in Clune. It's always, you always get a great, great welcome and they're so, they're so grateful uh, to Scotland for all the, uh, for all the help that's been given. Um, and that's Maria Ledesma, uh, one of the, she was, she is the deputy head of the primary school and, well, you that are, uh, uh, primary school teachers and that were primary school teachers will know uh, the great affection that you can often get from your pupils. Um, uh, St. Patrick's uh, Primary are about to find in the next couple of weeks uh, what mayhem I can cause in a classroom. <laughs> and uh, I just translated some of my worst jokes and worst songs into Spanish for those five years and created mayhem there. Um, so there they are, just, there they are, another, it's just a, a PE game. <laughs> it was just a wee peek uh, of running through, uh, running through hoops. Now there's loads of uh, inspirational people uh, that I would say, um, and one of them is Gloria. So Gloria worked in the in the soup kitchen that that we run through the through the primary school, uh, and she lives in great poverty. And one of the ah, terrible things is that my fear is that she will. Um, live all of her all of her life in in poverty I, you know some people uh, some people have the wherewithal to um, or even the job to earn cash to get out of um, the situation and I'll come on to some of them that I have I have known but Gloria one of my sadnesses uh, last October when I was there I, I suddenly realized probably Gloria will will live in a bamboo hut uh, for, for all of her life. She is, I, I'm not exactly sure what uh, age Gloria is. Um, I would say she's in her late 30s, early 40s. This is her eldest son, uh, Carlos, um, and he has left secondary school, but with no, uh, no qualifications. Um, then there is uh, Luciano, Andrea, the daughter, and Jair. So the four of them, um, live with their mum uh, in a bamboo hut, which, you know, the same, it's probably the area of four or five benches. Um, and uh, Gloria's uh, mum and grandmother, and her mum has special needs, and there's the grandmother. So they all live uh, there, but one of, and maybe, oh, I don't know, um, 2000 and Eight, while I was still there, uh, there was money from Scotland, and she had done so much work for the school that we thought it was appropriate to to help her with a payment for this uh, bamboo hut. Now, the bamboo hut has a lifetime of five years, more or less, 
what they say, five years. Um, so that was uh, 15 years ago, right? And they're still living it so much so that um, the kids uh, are now, um, they've set up a wee section of the garden, um, which is just a kind of mud floor, um, where they put down their mattresses at night and sleep there, just with, uh, with you know, kind of awnings over uh, to protect them from the flies. So there, you know, there's a lot of people who, a lot of people who have progressed. There's absolutely a lot of people who've progressed, but uh, many who will not be able to progress. Um, sorry, I've gone ahead without telling you. Um, in 2016, in 2016, um, there was a major earthquake in the Puerto Viejo area, which is uh, north of the country. And, um, you know, thousands of people, probably, they, they calculate that, the official records say that 600 people uh, lost their lives, but the truth of the matter is that it would have been more because people, um, you know, we don't, they don't have the same system of logging people, you know, social security. A lot of people don't sign up for social security, so they don't know exactly how many uh, people are in the country. So Puerto Viejo uh, was one of the epicenters of the earthquake, or the epicenter of the earthquake. So since then, I have gone and visited and become friends uh, with some of the communities up there. This was uh, Baraganete, um, where I was um, uh, welcomed and where we were able to distribute some of the trust's money. Uh, as you can see, just, it's not a shanty town, so it's a total different experience. It's way out in the country. It's kind of like, imagine, imagine, you know, the nearest town being Inverness from here. You're just, you know, hours and hours away from any contact with civilization, and governments only come round when it's election time. They've probably been round in the recent months, uh, but governments only come round in election time when they want to influence people for votes. Um, communities totally cut off, and one of the one of the um, communities uh, in one of the communities uh, while I was there, um, as well as the kind of food bank um, uh, uh, or food parcel distributions that we're able to uh, give out. Um, we came across um, a woman who was with, with, with a nun, Sister Teresina. Um, the nun was able to take me to a, 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 a family and the mother was expecting her ninth child, right? And they lived in one of these bamboo huts. And you just get the, the sense that you know, th there was no one directing their lives. You know, they were just totally abandoned. Um, and one of the questions Sister Teresina asked was, you know, why don't you, why don't you sign up with the government to get help for your kids? You know, so they can get education or get fed or whatever. You know, like they would take it in turn, turn. It's your turn to get fed today. You're not getting fed. You know, all that kind of stuff, right? And they said that they didn't want to sign up with the social security in case they get found out or, you know, in case the police came or something, you know. So the real lack of education causes other problems and um, um, other uh, difficulties and challenges. This is one of the um, chapels I went to. Um, I came across, completely by chance, I came across a woman called Esperanza. So, which obviously means hope. Um, it's a beautiful name. And Esperanza was um, Freddie, or is Freddie's mother. Freddie was the deputy head in the, in the school. And um, she kept in Guayaquil, she kept pigs in her house, right? Um, and as one of the, twice during my five years, I, because I was living in relative comfort of a, a brick-built house with a shower and all that kind of stuff. Um, so twice t for two weeks during my time, I did an exchange with Freddie. Freddie went and stayed in my house, and I stayed in his house, which didn't have any toilet running, running water or whatever, you know. And it was a kind of, I mean, it was a funny experience as well. They were, they were great and lovely people, but I was living beside the pigs. 
right? Um, and our, uh, d um, uh, it came, d at the end of the first day, I was thinking, yeah, I think I need to go to the toilet. But, you know, it was just a, sh it was in the garden, it was just a, in the garden, uh, it was just a kind of shower curtain for privacy. And um, so I went, I was just about to uh, go to the toilet when um, Freddie's disabled brother um, uh, came and said, Padre Martin, and he takes, yeah, okay, right, okay, I'll, I'll go to the toilet sometime later. But uh, so there was all sorts of um, problems. Anyway, so years later, I turn up, or last October, I turn up and found uh, Esperanza living in a different community at the north of the country, but uh, living with the pigs and the piglets. Um, so yes, Esperanza, one of the beautiful people I encountered while I was uh, in Ecuador. Um, there's a, a friend of mine, Joe Sakura, um, is He's just retired from being head of RE at um, St. Joseph's in Kilmarnock. We were at school together. He went to the seminary. Um, it, it didn't go through, obviously, um, and um, it didn't go through to priesthood, but um, he became an RE teacher. And since he's retired, he suggested that he and his wife, who's a primary school teacher, uh, could write um, an, an RE program that would be distributed uh, around schools and it's, we've centered it around a guy called, a uh, primary six boy called Marcelo, and it's called Marcelo Goes to School, so there'll be a, so you can, if you're, if you're uh, um, au fait with uh, primary six, then there'll be a kind of geography part to, where is Ecuador, how does Ecuador compare with Scotland? There'll be a language part, how do you say hello, how do you say goodbye, all that kind of stuff. There'll be a faith part, um, and it's accompanied by uh, various images of Marcelo and his sister uh, going to school. And uh, if I can head on to the wee video, hopefully. There we are. Come on. <laughs>
Buenos días, Marcelo. Okay, so I'm just asking him, how old are you? Ten years old? Who lives in this house? Mum, dad, sister, granny and granda, cousin, cousins, and uncle and aunt. So there's about ten people in the same house. So I'm just asking about Holy Family School. What, what subject do you like most? I love the teachers and my friends. Language and computing. Are you going to go to secondary school after it? Yeah. When you're big, what do you want to be? Want to be a vet? I hope you continue working hard. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, I mean, like Marcelo, hopefully, um, Joseph Cora and Anne are going to get that uh, together in the next wee while. Uh, but um, the, I think the important thing is just to. Um, you know, if, if the kids are able to, uh, primary school kids here are able to understand a wee bit of um, other people's situation in other parts of the world. Um, so I'm just going to um, move on to the final thing that I want to uh, speak to you about is the soup kitchen. So um, it's been going, the soup kitchen's been going since 2009. Um, at the moment, it's had to be, um, it's had to be um, paused, let's say, um, because, um, because of the pandemic, uh, there, wasn't as many, um, there wasn't as many funds coming in, so we've had to pause it. I'm just going to move on. So basically, uh, they'll come in uh, maybe about 80 or 90 kids every day. Of the, of the 400 that go to school, the, the most impoverished, let's say, uh, will come to, the, come to the soup kitchen. They'll get um, a cup of fresh juice, you know, actual fruit juice made from, I mean, the, the fruit and the, uh, the, you know, the fruit and the vegetables are so much more full of flavor than ours would be, you know. So some good fruit juice, uh, a plate of, uh, sorry, a plate of soup, homemade soup, and then rice and uh, rice and chicken or rice and fish, or rice and egg, or whatever. But, you know, when we go for a meal and we get rice and chicken, we'll get some rice and some chicken, you know? But they'll get a big plate of rice, because it's a big rice producer, a big plate of rice, much more, than, much more rice than we would eat, and then probably just the smallest bit of chicken or, or vegetables or whatever. So, um, and... There we are. I've included that picture because that, that shows you um, the fruit juice, the soup, and the, the rice and the chicken. And also, just in that uh, picture, um, Andrea from Gloria's family is there. So she's one of the, the pupils, for obvious reasons, she's one of the pupils that, uh, that goes to the uh, soup kitchen. Um, I see... So, if I could finish with um, an inspirational person called Paolo. So, Paolo was uh, one of the pupils at the secondary school when I arrived. Um, pa uh, Paolo Farias, and um, he lives, he, he has lived, um, sorry, that's him there. You can see that he's um, in his early 30s. Uh, when, he, when I arrived, he was a secondary school pupil. He's now late, late 20s, early 30s. He's uh, sitting beside his now wife, and uh, they've got two kids. And they live in a very small, it's not a brick-built house, but it's kind of prefab, um, uh, you know, prefab walls. Um, he is a teacher at our school. Um, sorry, I, I teach at Sagrada Familia School, a secondary school uh, teacher 
he does computing and language as well. And I, I just put him in because he is one of the people that, that makes you think that maybe, maybe there's hope, you know, in the midst of all of that poverty, you know, people will be able to, you know, to eke out a kind of path for the future together. Um, so um, so I'll, I'll just finish, finish with that. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions they wanted to ask um, or anything they wanted to comment on or say or whatever. Uh, uh, five years from 2004 to 2009. So, and, and I was lucky enough to, to be in the one place. Sometimes people moved on to another area or another shantytown after a couple of years, but I was there for five years, so I was able to... Um, when, when, when we moved, sorry, when I moved on, we were able to hand over to the archdiocese, hand over the parish, because the infrastructure was, had, you know, that we'd been able to uh, donate from Scotland was so good. So, sorry, you were going to ask. No, and recently asked, our, our trust, the Ecuador Trust asked, com, uh, contacted Mary's Meals to see, because, because we were having problems with our food kitchen, our soup kitchen, we thought, you know, maybe Mary's Meals would be able to kind of, um, but they also, Mary's Meals also have been having financial problems, and they have an international department, uh, so uh, it took me a while to get through to the international department, but, it, it, you know, eventually they got back and said, at the moment, we can't help. We're, they're in Quito, the capital of Ecuador, um, but they've not got scope yet to, to expand to other parts of Ecuador. So. Yeah, thank you. I mean, yes, I mean, wh at various times when I have gone out, I uh, have gone out with suitcases of T-shirts and trousers, uh, shorts, uh, pencil cases with rubbers and rulers and all that kind of stuff. It's, it, 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 was a great, it has been a great way of connecting our schools to their schools to say, you know, could you fill up a pencil case? Yeah, those, those things do and can happen. Sorry? For, for those remote communities, as I say, the, the government doesn't, doesn't hardly knows they're there. But the problem is, and that's what Sister T Teresina is trying to, one of, you know, she's a religious sister, right, and she's spreading the gospel. But the very practical way of spreading the gospel is to try and get as many people logged into the social security system, because they don't, it takes them a while to realize that, or it has, to, she says it has taken a while to get them to understand that it's not a bad thing to be logged into the government. You know, it's actually a good thing because you'll maybe be able to get health care down the line. You'll maybe be able to get your kids to school. You know, otherwise, you know, for instance, that, that family I was saying that she was expecting her ninth, ninth kid, you know, they, they just... Um, you know, they don't have education, they don't, you know, so they'll go through a life without education. And like pa the Paolo Farias is an example of what can happen if you've got an education. You know, there's a chance that you and your kids will be able to do some, have a, <coughs> a bit. I mean, he still lives in a fairly basic house. Um, he doesn't have a shower, for instance, uh, but, you know, it's, but he's able to advance, you know, so the social security, the government system is not great. Same, healthcare's, healthcare just the same. Um, there was a, another couple, I could have shown you other people as well, but there was another couple that lived over um, the back from me, and I used to 
you know, they were neighbors. So I, I used to pop in and see them on a regular basis. Um, they were the exact same age as my mum and dad at the time. Um, um, Anita is still living. The, her husband died just the year that I left. Um, but, um, you know, the healthcare system, there isn't an NHS. So you can't trundle up to a hospital and say, you know, I've, I've got a broken arm or I've got angina or whatever, you know. Um, uh, you know, you go to a, you go to a doctor, because it's all private, you go to a doctor and the doctor say, so that's 40 pounds for walking in the door. Uh, sorry, $40 for walking in the door. Um, and then you've got, um, then you've got maybe $50 for your tablets and all that kind of stuff, or $30 or whatever. So $70 compared with the fact, uh, would you like to eat tonight for $1? I'll take the eating for the $1 and just put up with the, the and, and that's just repeated, sadly that's repeated time again. Yes, that is a good, very good question. I, I, my own, I, I grew up in Irvine. We stayed in a council house and all that kind of stuff and went to school and, you know, I knew that we weren't um, rich, super rich or anything, but when you compare our lifestyle to two thirds of the world probably lives like that, we are the one third, you know. And, and it's not to make us feel embarrassed or anything, but it, it's, it's the reality, you know. So, you know, you know, education's the solution. Education is the solution. It's, it's certainly one of the solutions. Uh, more just governments would be another solution, but that's probably another, uh, another step down the line, you know. But education is um, one of the solutions. Also, as, as I say, there's parts of the country like where the earthquake was up in Puerto Viejo, there's parts of the country which are just abandoned. Abandoned. There's no, there's no roads, there's no hospitals, there's no nothing, you know. Um, so, you know, I mean, we might not even have heard of the government. It's, it, I would say, certainly in the shanty town where I was, and then in the remote parts of the country, it's seasonal to do with the crops or it's to do with, you know, it, like in the shanty town, it's to do with construction, you know, but it's seasonal and it's, you know, there's not a lot of, there'll be a long, long periods of uh, unemployment for them, you know. So, um, I'm conscious of time, so I thought um, we would conclude with um, a bit of prayer. So I'm going to ask Myra to read the gospel uh, of the mission of the disciples. Um, then, then I'll take a light from the Paschal candle, and um, if you want, if you're able to, to come forward. If you're not able to come forward, don't do it. Um, but come forward and just light a prayer, um, a lit candle as a way of praying for our, our sisters and brothers in Ecuador, particularly on this um, their election day. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. The eleven disciples set out for Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had arranged to meet them. When they saw him, they fell down before him, though some hesitated. Jesus came up and spoke to them. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teach them to observe all the commands I gave you. 
And know that I am with you always, yes, to the end of time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So we take a light from the light of Christ, the Easter candle, and ask Christ to bless us and to bless our sisters and brothers in Ecuador and in other needy parts of our world. So if anyone wants to come forward and light a candle.
Lord God, send your peace and your justice to a needy world. Help us to reach out to those in need, for you call us to be your missionary disciples. We pray for our friends in Ecuador, but all through the world who are in need of God's peace and justice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And if you're near a hymn book, if you could take one of the hymn books and turn to number 491, uh, the Magnificat put to tune and Um, obviously we're praying through the intercession of Our Lady the statue before us My soul proclaims you mighty God My spirit sings your prayer Just, um, you'll see that there's 
uh, a sheet which I invite you to take away. There are um, two specific projects that the Ecuador Trust is running. One is the 200 Club, which is a monthly draw for five pounds uh, a month. Uh, there's a £150 uh, prize every month or details about how to uh, make a donation. So if you're able to take that away. But thank you for coming out in uh, great numbers. I, as I say, I was expecting 10. Um, and as you know, in Trim, one of the things that I'm getting used to is highlighting people's birthdays. And uh, today, um, Mary Walsh is 80. Congratulations, Mary. <laughs> and the Women's Guild have a presentation for you. She's up in the back, as she normally is. There we are. Congratulations. <laughs> Mary, are you not coming up to sing a song? <laughs> we'll leave that for another day. So thank you everyone for coming out. Sorry for taking you away from the football and thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. 